to uh, Theophilus Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Uh, as uh, we're gathered here this afternoon, it is a, a little rainy today, but uh, as we're here, we're not just gathering in Anaheim, but we're gathering on Mount Zion. Uh, we are invited by God Himself to come and join Him, to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Uh, if you don't have the program, the program is available through the QR code, and so please uh, make note of that. Uh, there is also a sermon uh, youth worksheet uh, there at the front, uh, at the front of the entrance as well. Uh, as we're uh, here now, uh, let us uh, come together uh, and let us uh, bring our praises, our worship uh, to our triune God this afternoon. Let's all stand for God's invitation, His call to worship. And it comes to you again through this past week's Bible readings uh, that come to you from Psalm 21, uh, specifically verse 13. God's call to worship uh, says this, Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. Amen. Uh, let's uh, continue uh, to respond to God as we pray. Uh, the prayer of invocation and what that means uh, with the invocation. We are invoking God's name. We are asking God uh, to be present with us now. And so let's uh, come to him in prayer. Let's pray. We come before you this day, O God, in thanksgiving and praise to know that you are God and to place our lives in your hands. Uh, enlarge in our vision this hour then with your word that you would instill in us, again, that hope that comes from heaven, that hope that comes through Christ Jesus to displace our despair, that your peace uh, where hatred threatens, your joy amidst our depression, your love overwhelming our apathy. May your spirit this day then surround and indwell this congregation through the work, through the merit, uh, through that glorious resurrected Jesus, through what he has done forevermore, in whose name we now pray. Amen. Uh, this is God's invitation, his blessing of welcome into his presence. It comes to you through 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, the salutation. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let's uh, come before our God. Let's respond to this blessing that he's given to us by singing a hymn, a uh, hymn we call the doxology, hymn number 567. As we're seated together uh, now, uh, one of the delights that we normally don't think of as being uh, very delightful is the privilege of repenting and confessing our sins before uh, an all-merciful and loving God. And so we don't do this in order to try and manipulate God. We're not doing this in order to try and bargain with God. But when we repent, it is out of a sorrow. Uh, that we've hurt someone that we dearly love, uh, someone that dearly loves us. And so uh, let's come before him repenting of our sins, confessing of our sins, knowing full well that God hears us and that he is just to forgive us because of Christ. Uh, let's pray now. A Father in heaven, uh, it is such a joy to be in your house as your people giving King Jesus the praise, glory, and honor uh, that He alone deserves. Uh, far too often, Father, we try to make Jesus what we want Him to be. Uh, again, sometimes we find ourselves negotiating the terms of our relationship with Him. Uh, we create our own 
expectations of who Jesus should be in our own minds rather than the Word of God speaking for itself and trusting in what God and what Jesus has revealed Himself to be. Father, forgive us. Forgive us for trying to make Jesus something He's not and not worshiping the Jesus that is revealed in Scripture. He is far, far greater than what we could ever imagine. And this Jesus, this God, God incarnate has promised so much. And Lord, we pray that you would help us then this day to worship Christ deeply in light of who he is and what he has done for us, but also what he has promised he will still do. Help us, O oh God, to trust in this Christ and all of his promises. It is such a gift to be your church, to gather this day in your name, the first day of the week, to begin the week in worship of the triune God. May we then, as your people, worship you this day in spirit and in truth. And we pray all this in the wonderful name of Christ Jesus, in whom, in his name, we have gathered. Amen. This gospel word of assurance that Jesus gives to us uh, is found also in the Old Testament. And sometimes, uh, I think some, we, when we hear the word gospel, we think only in the New Testament. Uh, but those words of assurance also come to us through the Old Testament. And again, uh, using the words, uh, using a passage that uh, we looked at uh, from this past week's Bible readings, Psalm 17, verse 7, and then verse 15, Wondrously show your steadfast love. O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand, as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I await, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. Amen. How confident uh, David is and how confident we can be that we will, uh, at that time, uh, we will behold God's face in righteousness when we awake from death, that we will be satisfied with his likeness. We shall see him, as First John 3 reminds us, we shall see him as he is. In light of that, let's sing, let's respond to God's wonderful words uh, using, again, the Psalter, using the Psalms. Uh, you'll find that uh, in your Trinity Psalter hymnal, uh, 133b, uh, How Good and Pleasant is the Sight. this time, if we could have Chris, where they, I saw them, Carolyn and Celine, if you guys could come up along with uh, the session. Celine is 
as we prepare to baptize Celine this day. Uh, I want to read to you the words of institution, meaning the words that Jesus himself uh, has commanded the church just before uh, he ascends into heaven. Uh, he, we find those words in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And so let's listen carefully uh, to these very, very famous words, words that I think most of us are uh, familiar with. Uh, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Uh, As we think about baptism uh, this day, the Lord Jesus has instituted baptism, and it is a sign, it is a seal for his church. And he uses it not only for the admission of the person who is baptized into the visible church, but also to depict and to confirm his engrafting of that person. So this is Jesus including uh, Selene uh, into himself and his including that person in the covenant of grace. The Lord uses baptism to portray to us that we and our children are conceived and born in sin and need to be cleansed. He uses it. Jesus uses it to witness and seal to us the remission of sins and the bestowal of all the gifts of salvation through union with Christ. Baptism with water signifies and seals cleansing from sin by the blood and spirit of Christ together with our death unto sin and our resurrection unto newness of life by virtue of the death and resurrection of Christ. The time of the outward application of the sign does not necessarily coincide with the inward work of the Spirit with which the sign represents and seals to us. Because these gifts of salvation are the gracious provision of the triune God who is pleased to claim us as His very own, we are baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In our baptism, the Lord puts His name on us and claims us as His own and summons us to assume the obligations of the covenant He calls us, who have been baptized, to believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, to renounce the devil, the world, and the flesh, and to walk humbly with our God in devotion to His commandments. Uh, As as, uh, we prepare to uh, baptize Selim, I want to exhort all the members of the congregation, improve on your baptism. What does that mean? As solemn vows are about to be made before you, and baptism is now to be administered, all of you who are baptized, all of you who are baptized, is now to be, uh, will do well to take this occasion to reflect on your own baptism. Christ has put his name and claim on you. Right? What does that mean, that he put his name on you? He calls you to be repentant for your sins against your covenant God, to confess your faith before men, and to live in newness of life to God, who sealed his covenant with you by the blood of his own son. And so we also baptize this young child, remembering very well, why do we do this, right? Why do we baptize children, uh, especially as as, as Selene is unable to say this with her own mouth? Well, in the Old Testament, remember, he declared, God declared to Abraham, I will establish my covenant between me and to you and your seed, your children, and your generations, uh, and uh, and in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto you and to your seed after you. That's Genesis 17, 7. For this reason, in the Old Testament, God commanded the covenant infants to be the sign of circumcision. The covenant, though, is same in essence as in the old as in the new. And what that means is God's promises to the old, we find them in the new. And so it's not surprising that when we come to the New Testament, in the very first sermon, Peter preaches. He declares this promise to uh, the people listening in Acts 2.39. The promise is unto you and your children. He promises, uh, God promises, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your children house, Acts 16.31, and that he even God will even reaffirm in 1 Corinthians 7.14 that even if one parent is a believer, the children are what? Holy. Which is why Jesus even admitted little children into his 
presence, embracing and blessing them and saying, for instance, in Mark 10, 14, of such is the kingdom of God. And so in the New Testament, no less in the Old, we see these privileges. Once was circumcision is now seen in baptism. Once was bloody, but because of Jesus Christ dying on the cross, it is no longer bloody. Once, which was given only to males in the Old Testament, is now given to both male and female. And we see a beautiful picture of that today with Selene being baptized. And so let me uh, give these uh, uh, this, this covenant commitment, these vows in which the parents, uh, Carolyn and Chris, will affirm in the positive, saying yes to these four questions. And the, so the first one, do you acknowledge that although our children are conceived and born in sin and therefore subject to condemnation, they are holy in Christ by virtue of the covenant of grace and as children of the covenant are to be baptized. Yes. That was, that was a wonderful <laughs> yes. Just want to make sure everyone here knows that. Uh, vow number two, do you promise to teach diligently to Selene the principles of our holy Christian faith revealed in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments and summarized in the confession of faith and catechism of this church? Yes. Uh, number three, vow number three, do you promise to pray regularly with and for Selene? and to set an example of piety and godliness before her. Yes. And then lastly, the fourth one. Do you promise to endeavor by all the means that God has appointed to bring Selene up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, encouraging her to appropriate for herself the blessings and fulfill the obligations of the covenant? Well, let's uh, pray at this time as we prepare to see Celine uh, get baptized. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you that we have the privilege of seeing uh, young Celine getting baptized this day. Uh, we thank you for her and for her parents, uh, and not only for her parents, but also uh, this larger extended family that she has. Uh, but even larger than this extended family, it's this family that she has through the blood of Christ as we are gathered here this day to witness this wonderful sign and seal being given to her. We pray, Lord, that this entire congregation would set forth a godly example, praying with her and for her as we prepare to see her being baptized and engrafted into Christ Jesus and his church. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to get a nice cup of water. Okay. Celine Lan, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> yes. This is something wonderful. It, it's something to be celebrated. Um, so for the congregation. Yes. For the congregation, uh, this is your own commitment to her and to uh, the parents. As Selene is baptized into Christ and becomes a member of this visible church, the whole congregation is obligated to love her and receive her as a member of the body of Christ. Yes, as a baptized member, she is part of this church. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body and therefore members of one another. Christ claims this little child as his own and calls you to receive her in love and commitment. Therefore, you ought to commit, you ought to commit yourselves before God to assist Celine and her parents in her Christian nurture by godly example, prayer, and encouragement in our most precious faith. And then to uh, Chris and Carolyn. Beloved in Christ Jesus, we give thanks to God for this child that he has given you. And for your expressed desire for her, for Celine, to know the Lord and to follow him all her days, along with the great blessing of the gift of this child, have come very grave responsibilities that you have just acknowledged and to which you have solemnly committed yourselves. And I charge you to continue steadfastly in the commitments that you have made today before God and these witnesses, humbly relying upon the grace of God. Uh, in the diligent use of the means of grace, especially the word of God, the sacraments and prayer within this community. 
Uh, Elder Patel, if you could uh, pray on behalf uh, as we conclude uh, this part of our worship service. Let's, let's pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we, <clears throat> we thank you uh, for your faithfulness and uh, your grace in our lives. We thank you, Father, for uh, the blessing of your Son. And we thank you, Father, for the blessing you give us uh, of children. And uh, we pray and we are thankful, Lord, uh, for Celine. We pray that you would uh, continue to uh, be with her throughout her uh, life uh, as you have uh, in her young life. Uh, we pray that you would bless her and encourage her. Uh, be with uh, her parents. We pray uh, that you will be with Chris and Carolyn, that you may encourage them and uh, be with them as uh, they raise Celine in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Give them wisdom. Give them understanding. Give them patience, uh, Father. Uh, help them uh, to be that wonderful example uh, of Christ Jesus in the life of Celine. And uh, so that, Father, as she grows up, she will see their faith. She will see the love of Christ, the compassion of Christ, the joy of Christ, and that, Father, she would grow to confess Jesus as her Lord and Savior. We thank you, Lord, uh, for your blessings upon our lives. We pray that you would also uh, be with the little one uh, in Carolyn's womb as well, that you would bless uh, that little baby and that uh, you would bless the child and the mother uh, for full term. Father, we thank you. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. As we extend that right hand of fellowship to the family, uh, please do uh, see to it that you also uh, extend that fellowship to them uh, after service. One of the, again, a great delight in seeing them or in seeing Celine baptized uh, is that during this time of reception, uh, we proceed uh, in our worship to uh, confess a common confession. Uh, one of the delights of, of being able to confess this common confession is that it's something not only are, are we sort of exclusively sitting here and saying, oh, only we know this. No. Uh, rather, there is a larger visible church that God has established, uh, not only here in Anaheim, but throughout this region that we call our uh, Southern California Presbytery, uh, but also throughout uh, the nation with the country, with our uh, Orthodox Presbyterian Church, uh, but also, again, throughout the world, brothers and sisters uh, that God has collected, that God has gathered throughout the world to worship Him this day, there is this common confession and again, one of the incredible things is brothers and sisters who have come before us, who are part of that great cloud of witness now, who have, who have passed on, who have died and have been uh, brought into the presence of God, who also have this common confession. Uh, and so let's uh, confess uh, these following questions of the Westminster Larger Catechism. Uh, you'll find that on page 944. Uh, as we prepare to confess our faith together, uh, you'll find uh, questions 43, 44, and 45. Uh, and you'll notice uh, trying to group all of them uh, with a certain theme and, and bring them together. Uh, and so with question 43, I'll read the question, and then uh, all of us, uh, let us respond confessing our faith with the answer. Question 43, how doth Christ execute the office of a prophet? And the answer... Christ executed the office of a prophet in his revealing to the church in all ages by his spirit and word in diverse ways of administration, the whole will of God in all things concerning their edification and salvation. Uh, question 44, how does Christ execute the office of a priest? And the answer... in his once offering himself as a sacrifice without spot to God to be a reconciliation for the sins of the people 
and in making continual intercession for them. And then lastly, question 45, how does Christ execute the office of a king? And the answer, Christ executes the office of a king in calling out of the world a people to himself and giving them officers, laws, and censures by which he visibly governs them in bestowing saving grace upon his elect, rewarding their obedience and correcting them for their sins, preserving and supporting them under all their temptations and sufferings, restraining and overcoming all their enemies, and powerfully ordering all things for his own glory and their good, and also in taking vengeance on the rest who know not God and obey not the gospel. Well, as we uh, continue with worshiping our triune God, uh, at this time we bring our offerings. Uh, Even as uh, last week's reading with uh, the lady and uh, the two bites, it's not a matter of the amount, it's a matter of the heart in which we give uh, generously and graciously uh, for all that God has given us. Uh, We so now uh, give unto the Lord and to the ministry of His church. So as the deacons uh, come by to collect, let us... uh, uh, bring our offerings. Uh, let's uh, pray, or, or let's uh, sing at this time uh, using hymn number 194 Gracious Savior, Gentle Shepherd. here now. Let's uh, come together with the pastoral prayer. Uh, In this part of the worship, uh, it it can be difficult at times to be fully focused, uh, but let us uh, give our all as we pray, as we come together through one voice, uh, praying and asking God to to really care for this congregation. Let's pray now. Uh, Holy God, we come before you at this time in prayer, lifting up to you the joys and concerns, the hopes and Uh, the desires of our lives. May we be open uh, to your calling in our lives that we would see with new eyes and hear with new ears uh, the direction that you would have us go, uh, that we would submit to your will and we would do so with great delight and with great joy. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would uh, bless the gathering of your people uh, here in the city of Anaheim. Uh, particularly as we think of uh, moving towards uh, Stanton, we pray that you would bless that move, that you would make 
uh, this clearer and clearer. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would uh, remove obstacles and that uh, you would allow for that smooth transition, uh, O oh Lord. Uh, we pray that this might be accomplished uh, at some point this year even. Uh, we pray and ask that, uh, that we as a congregation would grow and flourish in your love and grace for the purposes to which you have called us, that we would be more greatly uh, discipled, uh, that we would understand this commitment that you have called us to, uh, that the purpose and work of the church uh, is to create disciples, is to make disciples of all nations through the baptism and teaching of your word, all that Jesus has commanded. And so we ask, O oh God, that as a congregation, uh, allow us to flourish in our being discipled, uh, that we would grow in our commitment to the word of God, to the teaching of the apostles, uh, to fellowship, uh, that we would grow in our commitment to uh, the breaking of bread as we think of the sacraments, and especially to prayer, that we as a congregation would grow in these means that you have given to us, uh, that we would grow in greater grace, that we would grow in greater love, uh, that we would grow in greater delight in Jesus Christ. As a church, then, we ask, as we bring uh, these prayer requests before you, uh, Lord, we pray uh, for uh, our uh, future officers. Uh, we pray for Josh as we look forward in the coming months uh, to a congregational meeting to vote on Josh. Lord, we thank you that he has been certified and that uh, as a session he has been tested. Uh, and we pray, Lord, as we look forward uh, to him and others, uh, we pray that, uh, that you would continue to raise up officers uh, for this church, equipping this church, uh, with uh, godly and humble men. Uh, Lord, we think of Sen and his desire to enter ministry as he uh, goes on to complete uh, soon uh, this second year of seminary. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would bless his work, and uh, especially as he returned from his time in Cambodia uh, and as he will um, be going off to New Jersey for the Boardwalk Chapel in the summer. We pray that you would bless him and uh, Lord, we ask that, uh, that he would uh, understand during this time of seminary more fully what it means uh, to be called to the ministry. Uh, Lord, we think of others in the congregation, others who uh, have suffered loss. Uh, Lord, uh, those who have suffered a great uh, pain and anguish uh, through family members. And uh, Lord, we pray uh, as we think specifically of uh, Colin, uh, Colin and Teresa, Colin's father, having suffered a stroke this morning. Uh, we pray and ask, O oh God, that you would uh, grant to him uh, recovery, uh, that you would grant peace to both Colin and Teresa, uh, and Lord, that this would be an opportunity where the gospel uh, that, that uh, Colin's father would turn to you in greater love and reliance. Uh, Lord, we think of uh, the Patel family, and, and we think of uh, the loss of this uncle uh, in the past, uh, last week. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would grant, again, peace and comfort to this family, uh, Lord, especially, uh, we pray that um, as all things are uh, in your hands and according to your will being done, uh, Lord, we pray that you would have mercy, uh, that you would have mercy uh, on those that uh, continue to uh, be alive. We pray that there are family members that we know that do not believe, family members and, and dear friends who do not know you. We pray for uh, they're coming to the knowledge of Christ. In that, Lord, that prayer extends for anyone here as well. Is there anyone here that does not know you? Is there anyone here, O oh God, that does not know uh, the gracious and loving mercy of Jesus Christ? We pray and ask that those who are here, uh, that if there is anybody uh, that does not know you, would come, that you would uh, break their hearts, that you would uh, open their hearts, that their hearts would be transformed from stone to flesh, uh, that they would come to know uh, the love of the Savior, of that gracious Savior, gentle shepherd. Uh, we ask, O oh God, if there's anyone here that is struggling in their faith, that do know you, but struggles mightily, uh, Lord, we pray that your mercy would be upon them, that your loving mercy be upon them, that they know that they are not outcasts, that they would know that they are beloved by you, uh, that they would know that uh, you see them and you are near. Uh, we pray and ask, O oh God, that uh, for those of us here uh, who are in a time uh, of 
delighting in, in uh, where we in a season of, of much blessing and uh, Lord that we would take the time to extend ourselves uh, to those in the congregation who are struggling uh, Lord we thank you for those blessings we thank you for uh, bringing us into a season of, of uh, enjoyment and delight and yet again Lord uh, that we would never look upon these things as an opportunity to boast, as an opportunity uh, to say, look at all that I have done and accomplished in my life, but rather it is an opportunity for us to humbly come before you in thanksgiving and gratitude, that we would show you that great delight and that great joy and thankfulness. Uh, Lord, we pray that you continue to be with um, others uh, whose health is, um, that are struggling in their health, uh, Lord, uh, we pray that you would bring healing and restoration upon them. Uh, we ask, Lord, that uh, th- that this would be a good testimony to the con- uh, to the world around us. Uh, Lord, uh, that in our difficulties, in our struggles, in the time of our health uh, being frail, uh, Lord, that that, uh, that 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 testimony of God's goodness and love would go forth confidently and boldly. Uh, Lord, we we pray as well for those who. Uh, are involved in missionary work. Uh, Lord, we thank you uh, for Reverend Kim and his wife and returning safely uh, for this uh, time period. Uh, Lord, we pray for the works that are going on throughout the world and and, uh, in Africa. And uh, Lord, that we would continue to be supportive uh, in prayer, uh, in financing, uh, that we would be supportive uh, in that great work of seeing your church, of seeing your word go forth. Uh, so that more and more disciples of Christ would be made. Uh, Lord, as we're here now and as we uh, look forward to this time uh, to hear your word, we thank you for the baptism, the good baptism that was done uh, in seeing Celine uh, uh, receiving that sign and seal. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the children that are amongst us. Uh, We thank you for their coos. We thank you for their cries. We thank you for their screeches. Uh, Lord, we thank you that we are reminded of the sounds of the covenant and that we are not ashamed of those sounds, but rather we embrace them. Uh, And so, Lord, continue to bless this congregation in seeing uh, these children uh, come of age and confess and embrace the faith uh, as their own, uh, that they would not deter, that they would not um, refuse, uh, refuse that calling of obedience that you have given to them. Uh, that they would grow uh, to love you more and more. We thank you. We pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, well, uh, congregation, let's all uh, turn open to our Bibles. Uh, let's turn open to our Bibles uh, to the book of Luke. Uh, in light of today's baptism, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 17, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 19. Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 19. It's a little bit longer, but uh, let's uh, give careful and reverent attention uh, to the public reading of God's holy word. Luke 17, beginning with verse 1. And he said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck, and he were cast into the sea, than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day, and turns to you seven times, saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, Increase our faith. The Lord said, If you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and recline at table, 
Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink? And afterward, you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except for this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Amen. This ends the reading of God's holy word. Maybe this is kind of an odd passage to look at for baptism. Right? Uh, today, Celine was baptized, and she was given a sign and a seal uh, that she is part of God's visible covenant community. Right? This visible community, this local church. And that's something I want to remind you, that Celine is part of this local church. Right? She's a member of this church, even as an infant. She is a member of this church. And I want us to understand the gravity of what it means to have not only her, but these other children to be part of this visible community. And what I want us to do is tie in especially thinking about verse 1 and 2. Right? Uh, but if we were to look at verses 1 and 2, right, and we're not just going to focus on verses 1 and 2, uh, especially verse 2, where it sounds incredibly, incredibly uh, difficult to digest, difficult, uh, it sounds really harsh. And it, it's, it's meant to be harsh. But we also have these random sayings, right, all the way through verse 19. Verses 3 through 4 is another section, right, about sinning and forgiving. Verses 5 through 6, about this topic of faith. Verses 7 through 10, this parable about obedience and service. Uh, and then you get to verses 11 to 19, and this uh, story about ten lepers, Right? There's five total sections here, and it doesn't really seem like any of them are connected. Right? It just seems like, uh, again, the tendency is for people, oh, these are just the sayings of Jesus. Right? They're just a bunch of sayings, and they're just kind of strung together the way you might think of a pearl necklace. Right? A pearl necklace, you just have all these beads, or, or those beads that maybe children make and they give to their uh, parents, where you just stick a lot of those beads together, and, and it just it feels all separated. It, it barely feels connected to one another. Well, we're looking at this entire section because what it's going to do is give us a clear understanding of what it means, of what it means to have these children in our, uh, in our midst, what it means for us living the Christian life, right? Living the Christian life as God's people here. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's begin by looking at verses 1 and 2 now. Right? And Jesus directs his words to his disciples and he says to them that temptations, temptations to sin, are sure to come. They're coming. But woe to the one in whom they come. Right? In other words, Jesus is uh, explaining to us very clearly that temptations are a very, very real thing. Right? Unfortunately, temptations, I think, sometimes gets downplayed. Right? Uh, you even have uh, the word uh, temptations. It's often... Uh, seen kind of like the way we think of love, right? I love pizza or I love you, right? I love chocolate, I love you. Uh, those, those three words, right? Temptations is sometimes seen and downplayed also, right, in that way. And so the word temptation, ooh, don't tempt me, right? It, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but I want us to understand the gravity of temptation, right? The seriousness of temptation here in our passage, uh, because in the ESV, it, it says temptation to, sin, temptation to sin. The word itself is actually the word we use for scandal, right? It's a scandal. The NIV actually translates this word uh, to stumble, as in stumbling blocks. 
right? And so we get a visual picture of what a temptation is. It is a block by which you stumble on it, right? You're walking, you hit something, and as a result, you stumble, uh, maybe even fall to the floor, right? And so again, the, the picture of temptation, it's something that's going to cause you to fall. And so Jesus makes it very clear, right, as we move on to verse 2. If you are the direct cause, if you're the cause for tripping up others, for tripping up others, of causing them to stumble in their faith, your actions, your words, things that you do, if you are causing them to fall, especially, again, remember, we're talking about your actions having these grave eternal consequences, if you are the cause of these little ones to stumble, Jesus says, woe to you. Woe to you, right? The opposite of blessed are those. Woe to you for being a stumbling block to others. And he actually says, it'd be better for you. This is, this is extremely harsh. It is better for you to tie yourself to a millstone and go throw yourself into the ocean. And you got to understand, what's a millstone? A millstone is not a rock. It's not even like a stone. A millstone is like a, is like a ton, like a, a, a 1,500 to 2,000 pound huge rock that's used as it spins one way and it spins the other way to grind up grain. That one ton piece of rock, tie yourself to it and let it get thrown into the sea. It is better if that were to happen to you than for you to stumble any one of these young ones, any one of these little ones. If you are the reason, if you are tempting others, if you are causing others to sin, it'd be better for you to be found at the bottom of the ocean. Right, and I want us to understand the severity of what Jesus is saying here. Right, this is one of those things where I think a lot of people just want to skip over. But it's so severe because that's how precious, and I want you to understand it, that's how precious these little ones are to Jesus. That's how precious Celine and others like her in our congregation are to Jesus. Right? In other words, uh, let, let's expand this even a little bit. Is there anyone in this congregation that you think of as being insignificant? Right? Or is there anyone in the congregation that you think of as being weak? Is there anyone in the congregation, because of their disability, you think, you know, they really don't matter? Because in Israel at this time, you have to understand, if you are not the, the picture of perfection, if you are not this person uh, who had no blemishes, you were seen as weak and unnecessary, marginalized, and you were thought to be meaningless. And see, children were seen in that light. And the reason for that is because a child could not benefit you. They had no real power. Right? In your own mind, as you look at a child, what can that child do for me? That child can't do anything for me. He cannot advance me in my career. He cannot advance in providing me anything. And so a little child, just like uh, perhaps there are those who are weak and poor and blind and crippled, those who you think can't benefit me, they are meaningless, they are insignificant, they really don't matter. And so the idea then, what Jesus is saying very clearly, if you think they are unnecessary and they are meaningless and insignificant, if you think any of them don't really matter, and so to tempt them, to cause them to sin, to cause them to stumble, Jesus is saying, let me make that very clear. It's better for you to be found at the bottom of the ocean. Do not, in other words, do not cause my little ones to stumble because of your actions. And this is a question I think that all of us, all of us can take time to really think about and digest and uh, to, really, to really ponder. What does that mean? What are my actions like? 
Right? And it's an opportunity for us to be very honest with yourselves. And no, I'm not asking you at this time to say anything out loud, no. But it's something that you can think about. It's something that you can ask yourselves and talk about even amongst maybe your spouse, maybe others in the congregation. Do you realize that your actions have an effect on the little ones in this congregation? I think about what does it mean to be present? And, you know, and this is something that you hear oftentimes, right? A com- maybe a complaint between uh, spouses even, and, and, and you see it often, right? Um, when you're here with us, be here, be present. Like, I don't care if your body's here, but we want your mind to be here as well. Right? And think about that. It's not, it's not just your being absent in the midst of the congregation, Right? And so I'm not just talking about only worship, but I'm talking about in the life of this church to be negligent, to, be, uh, to, to not be present. And so whether it's physical or even uh, emotional, mentally, are you present? Are you present? Because if you're not, what are you communicating to the church and especially to these little ones? What are you saying to them? That I don't need to actually be here. I don't have to physically be here, let alone be mentally here with the congregation. It doesn't matter that God has made me part of this visible community. It doesn't matter that I've taken vows to be part of this visible community. It doesn't matter that I'm a part of this congregation because the reality is you don't really mean that much to me and I don't care whether I'm here or not or whether I'm present here or not, physically or mentally. And again, this is what Jesus is getting after. Hey, if that's the case, it'd be better for you to be found at the bottom of the sea tied to a millstone. That's just verses 1 and 2. Right? Jesus is moving on here. And again, we could really, really let those first two verses, uh, what we might say, marinate in our minds. And he's after this idea that, are you a stumbling block to others? And now with verses 3 through 4, he switches things. See, and this is how we're seeing the connection here. Verses 3 through 4, he switches things around. And he's not talking about you being a stumbling block, but what happens when you are stumbled? Right? The King James actually says, uh, making offense. Right? What happens when you're offended? Right? What are you going to do? Right? It's one thing that you're an offense to others, that you're a stumbling block to others. But what happens when you're offended, when you're stumbled? Oh, well, now. See what Jesus is saying in verses 3 through 4. You're called to forgive. To forgive and keep forgiving. Right? In other words, Jesus is saying, show the mercy that you've been shown. Because let's face it, we know, we acknowledge, hey, we are stumbling blocks. Right? We know we are the cause of others to stumble and sin. Things that we've said, things that we've done, maybe actions that we're not even aware of what we've said or done. Right? We said something out of ignorance and it just eats and bites away at others. Actions Right? that were meant to be very neutral, weren't meant to mean anything, and yet it hurt others greatly. Right? Maybe it's a comment on, on the appearance or, or something that was meant to be complimentary, but it just completely backfires, and it's not that at all. And maybe even cause a person to cry because of that. Forgiving others. No matter how many times you've gone to God, God has always forgiven you. As much as seven times, 70 times seven. But it's hard when we acknowledge and we understand when someone hurts you, it is very, very hard. It's hard when someone has spoken ill of you, maybe behind your back. And sometimes they're not even going to ask for forgiveness because maybe they're not aware, but maybe they don't even care, right? The damage is done. It is what it is. You know, you can't do anything about it, whatever. The guy doesn't really mean that much to me anyway. Move on with your life. 
Right? And so the apostles, when being told, when being exhorted, forgive and keep on forgiving, don't stop forgiving. The response that the apostles have in verse 5, increase our faith. Right? Increase our faith. Because they know, they acknowledge that this is, we can't do this. How are we supposed to do this? Increase our faith, Jesus. And when you hear what the apostles are saying right now, man, it sounds really good, right? right? How often uh, we, we sit there, oh, increase our faith. right? Help my unbelief. Right? I can't do this, so increase my faith, Lord. Right? And the fact that we talk about our faith growing, our faith becoming, we want it to grow and be nurtured. And, and so increase our faith sounds really, really good. If only that's really what they mean. See, these disciples, what they're really saying, when they say increase our faith, it's actually not compliment. It's, it's actually not a good thing, what they're saying here. Right? In other words, what they're saying is, my faith is at this level. It can't possibly do what you're asking. See, it, sound, it might sound holy, but in actuality, what these disciples are doing is they're shifting the responsibility away from themselves. And there's a slight undertone of blaming God. You know we can't do this. You're expecting too much. You're expecting too much of a commitment here. You're expecting too much. You want me to do what now? No, I don't think so. If you want that to happen, increase our faith. Do not hold us responsible for where we're at. We're at this level. If you want us to go a little bit further, increase our faith. And here's the kicker. This language here, increase our faith, it's actually a command that they're giving Jesus. The request isn't so much an exclamation, oh, increase our faith, but it's actually a command to Jesus, increase our faith. You want me to be more committed? Increase my faith then. Increase my faith. You want me to give more? Well, increase this. Increase that. It's not my fault that I don't have enough faith. So increase it, Jesus. If you want me to do what you want, then increase my faith. Don't expect me to forgive other people and their offense against me. Because I'm at this level. Don't get at me because I'm at this level. You want me to be a little bit more? Then increase my faith. See, and that's why then in verse 6, what does Jesus say? Right? He's just got this short statement. Hey, you know what? If you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to the mulberry tree, uproot yourself and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. See, what Jesus is saying, and you have to understand, mustard seed, you know, a lot of people... When I say, oh, no, the mustard seed is not the smallest seed in the world. Well, you've got to understand, Jesus is not going to get into the scientific aspects of things. What he's simply saying, and it's not in this passage, but uh, what he's simply saying is that the mustard seed, as far as the entire society, an agrarian society, as far as they understood, the mustard seed was the smallest seed known. Known to all the farmers. Right? Uh, the mustard seed was the smallest seed. And so that mustard, that single grain of mustard seed is so small. But Jesus is saying, the point that Jesus is making. See, your problem isn't that, oh, increase our faith, because if you have faith, even as small as a mustard seed, this is something you can do. See, the problem is that these disciples, they think, Jesus, you're, you're, you're telling me to do more than what I'm capable of doing. And what Jesus is saying, no, look, if you even have just a mustard seed faith, you can Right? And sometimes people want to talk about, oh, there are these like higher level Christians, right? They're, they're really super committed, but you know what? I'm over here. Don't ask me to get to that point. Or sometimes you might even hear people try and talk about carnal Christian versus like a spiritual Christian, right? That there's only certain kinds of people, you know, people that like kind of devote their life and, and, and you know, like pastors or elders, deacons. Yeah, I'm not one of those. I'm not one of those. Right? Those are people that are committed. I like to be a little bit more on the fence. I like to be a little bit, you know what? I got, I got a life to live. I'm a little bit busy. I've got other things going on with my life. 
You know, my faith is at this level. Don't ask for it to be anymore. Unless you want to increase it. Unless you want to increase it, back off. Right? See, what Jesus is getting after is, look, stop with the excuses. Right? Rather than constant why I can't, why I can. Right? We want to justify and explain and excuse our sinfulness. But Jesus is saying a faith as tiny as a mustard seed, even that kind of faith can move this mulberry tree, be uprooted and put into the, uh, into the sea. And you have to understand, again, think of it this way. Is that mustard seed faith enough for you to be saved? For you to experience salvation into the presence of God. Is that tiny mustard seed faith enough where you will be out of this world and brought into the presence of God with joy and delight? Is that mustard seed faith enough to do that? Yeah. Then it is enough for you to be committed. It is enough for you to be committed in the Christian life. Somehow we think, oh, that that faith that saves, that faith that saves can be as tiny as a mustard seed. But somehow, then to talk about being committed to the Lord, to committed to the kingdom, committed to the work of the Lord, no, I need more faith than that. Faith that saves The faith that God will use to save you and bring you into the presence of God is somehow not enough for you to live Christ-like lives. So Jesus, in these first few verses, in the first six verses, He's coming out hard. He's coming out swinging. And He is rebuking the disciples. Rebuking the disciples. Get your act together here. Let me ask you, as soon as you hear all this, as soon as you hear this in your heart, you know, maybe not now, maybe not here right now, but as you hear all this, what is your response to that rebuke? What is your response to that correction? What is your response to God bringing out this word? Do we, in response to hearing this, does it cause us to, in several ways, to respond with pouting? Right? In our hearts. Fine. Fine, I'll do it. Right? Maybe there's a little bit of wine associated with that. Right? A little bit of sulkiness, a little bit of being bad tempered. Fine, I'll do it. You know, whatever you want. Okay, I'll do it. Or maybe it goes in in another direction where it's like, you know what? Yeah, I'll do it. I'll prove you wrong. I'll show you. I can do this. And so you dig in a little bit deeper, right? You you get a little bit harder, a little bit harsher. And like, I'm going to do this. I can prove it. I can prove you wrong. Look, I'm going to flex hard to show you that I can do this. Or maybe, fine. You know what? You win. Whatever. We just sort of get a little bit sunken. And so we're just more apt to go through the motions as if that's any better. See, at the heart of what Jesus is after here in verses 7 through 10 now, right, with verses 7 through 10, with this, uh, the, these, these servants, right, he's describing these servants as they're not friends. But they're doing their duty. And so in verse 10, right, Jesus, it's actually in a mocking tone in verse 10. We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Right, again, it kind of sounds incredibly humble. But the idea here is that after obeying the Lord, right, after doing what the Lord wanted you to do. We are unworthy servants, Lord. Right, and, and you can almost imagine uh, kneeling on one knee with your head down. We are unworthy servants, Lord. And we have only done what is our duty. 
as if somehow that is to communicate to Jesus, right? Oh, wonderful. Good. My children. Right? Can, can you imagine in, in, in this sense, your child? Or, or what do you think would happen if you said to your parents, as they asked you to do something, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what is our duty. Dad, mom. It's actually quite offensive. See, and that's the point then of verses 11 through 19. I want you to see the flow of the argument that's being made by Jesus. See, in verses 11 through 19, Jesus now, you have the story of him going to Jerusalem, and he sees, right, as he's going to, or not Jerusalem, but, um, or towards Jerusalem, he's passing through Samaria and uh, Galilee. And he sees off to the side ten lepers. Right? And again, remember what lepers were. Lepers, lepers, and, and let me make this very clear, because again, we, as we went through our readings uh, through Deuteronomy and, and, and Leviticus, um, leprosy is not something we see today. Right? I, I don't want us to understand today is probably more like something called Hansen's disease or, or um, if you see discoloration. It, it, that's not leprosy. Right? And I think uh, oftentimes we think, oh, leprosy, anyone with any kind of blemish or disfiguration of their skin is, is somehow immediately, oh, leprosy, you know, be away from me. That leprosy described here in Scripture is, is the kind where uh, you would have, um, your, your, your body parts would be falling off of you, right? Your body parts would be falling off of you. Uh, the skin is just completely just, just almost like melting. And so you have these folks, um, in, in many ways, it was kind of like uh, death walking around. Uh, it, you're, you're just kind of at that point waiting for a person to die, someone who has leprosy. And so they see Jesus walking by, and, and immediately they see him, and they're like, Lord, have mercy on us. They know who he is. They acknowledge Jesus. They know he can heal them. They ask Jesus, show us mercy, heal us. And he tells the ten lepers, what does he do? He tells them, go, show yourselves to the priests, right? And you'll be cleansed. But only one of them, and a Samaritan no less, only one of them comes back to Jesus to say thank you. Only one of them comes back. But here's the thing. Those other nine, they do exactly what Jesus told them to do. He didn't tell them, come back and thank me. He doesn't say that. They actually, technically, did they do anything wrong? In a manner of speaking, they didn't really do anything wrong. They did exactly what they were told to do. But in the midst of doing what they were told to do, you begin to see what's going on inside their hearts. Right? They may have done, in other words, the idea of this idea of we're unworthy servants and we have done what you wanted us to do. And yet what we see in them is that they don't have, they don't have a measure of gratitude, a measure of thankfulness. There's no joy in their hearts. They work hard in the field, in other words, right? Verses 7 through 10. They work hard in the field. Then they prepare dinner for their masters. We have done what you wanted us to do. And that's the problem. We did what we're told to do, but there's no gratitude. There's no, th there's no joy in your heart in doing this. It's the idea of saying, you know, fine, I'll do what you want me to do. And whether it's to prove you wrong or it's out of a whiny heart or it's just kind of resigned to doing it and saying, you know, you win. I don't even want to give it much thought. But it's this lack of joy, this lack of gratitude and thankfulness in their heart. It shows, it comes out what is going on inside them. And it always comes out and it comes out even in the way we interact with one another, let alone in the way we interact with God. And our little ones see that. And that is what Jesus is getting at here. It's very simple and yet very profound. If we live the Christian life out of a 
forced manner. We live it out because we are forced to do it. There's no joy. There's no gratitude. There's no thankfulness in the heart. And you have to understand where that begins to take us, the kind of road it takes us down. Because if the Christian life, if the idea of forgiving, if the idea of not being a temptation and stumbling block to others, the idea of of serving, the idea of loving, the idea of obeying, all of this is simply an obligation. And when I don't need it, it's an excuse for why I can't do it. When life looks like that, there's no delight. There's no joy. There's no enjoyment of the Christian life. And what we begin to show and demonstrate and model for others, especially our young ones, especially our little ones, is that we become a stumbling block. We become a stumbling block to others. We begin to show them. I do it because why? I don't know. I just did this my whole life. I don't know why I'm doing it. I kind of don't care because as soon as I'm old enough, I'm getting out on my own. I don't know. Why am I doing it? Well, if I don't, then I'm going to get in trouble. You know, pastor's going to get on my back. Why do you do what you do? I don't know. If I don't, I might go to hell. The whole idea of the Christian life, it becomes fear-based and it becomes, man, I really just don't want to go to hell. But it's not about the delight and enjoyment of being with God. Can you imagine our Savior in this way? This is where I want to conclude things. Can you imagine our Savior going to the cross with that attitude? Well, well, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to go to the cross for these people that don't even appreciate what I've done? Why do I have to go to the cross, Father, and save these people who aren't going to really, really embrace what I'm doing for them anyhow? Why do I have to go to the cross? Let's just start over. Forget these people. Let's just start over. We can easily do that. It'd be a lot easier. Why do I have to come into this world? Why do I have to become human? Why do I have to go through the persecution by things that I made? Why do I have to go through the persecution and the suffering? And why do I have to be laughed at and mocked by these people who don't even know better? Why do I got to endure this? I don't want to go through all this. Can you imagine Jesus coming into this world with that mindset, with that attitude? Can you imagine Jesus coming into the world, going through 33 years, going to the cross, For them? For these people? Can you imagine Jesus doing any of his obedience? Well, I better do it because if I don't, then, well, this isn't going to work out then, is it? Right? We, We sometimes focus on his actions, but do we understand what was behind even his heart? And I want us to see that a passage like Hebrews chapter 2, in verse 11 and 12, it says this. That is why, concerning Jesus, that is why Jesus, he is not ashamed to call you guys brothers, you guys his family, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus comes into this world. To do what he does, to go to heaven, to return to heaven in resurrection and ascension. And he wants, without shame, he is not ashamed to call you his brothers and sisters. And he wants the world to know and sing in your presence. Praise to God. See, if you understand that this is what Jesus has done for you, at no point does Jesus look at you and bemoan you. No no point does Jesus look at any of you and say, man, you know what? I'm really, really just, I'm fed up with this guy. But rather, in great joy, in great love, in great delight, out of thankfulness and gratefulness for you, he goes to the cross. 
He, he doesn't do this as an unworthy slave, as an unworthy servant. Well, I did what I had to do. Here it is. Let's get on with it. But he did this. He forgave you. And because of the forgiveness that we've seen, because of the forgiveness that we've experienced, that we are all too eager to do this likewise. So that there's no one in the congregation that we look at and we say, you know what, they're not that important. You know what, I don't need to be reconciled with them. I don't need to forgive them. I don't need to be forgiven by them. See, as we grow as a community, as we grow, we are collaborating together. And these, these are sort of buzzwords, but we're, we're collaborating with Celine, with her parents, to be a real blessing in God's community. All right, what we want to do is grow in grace, in mercy with one another, in our own relationship with God, and a relationship with each other. Right, again, let me, let me just conclude now with this one exhortation that you heard earlier during Selene's baptism. As Selene is baptized into Christ and becomes a member of his visible church, right, again, listen carefully, the whole congregation is obligated to love her and receive her as a member of the body of Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body and therefore are members of one another Christ claims this little child as his own and calls you to receive her in love and commitment. Therefore, you ought to commit yourself before God to assist Celine and her parents in her Christian nurture by godly example, prayer, and encouragement in our most precious faith. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that as we're reminded again on this day, that we gather here together as a congregation to delight in you. But in coming to you, it is also to delight in one another. That like Christ, we are not ashamed to call one another brothers and sisters. And we are not ashamed to sing praise to God in our midst. Oh Lord, we pray that we would grow in this grace and knowledge of Christ, that we would grow in our commitment that we would grow in our desire to love you and to do it with joy and thankfulness. Lord, we are humble. We are humbled that you embrace us as your own, as your family. Then let us not only embrace one another, but that we would see others who do not know you come to be embraced, that we would be your tool that we would be your vehicle, that we would be your uh, jars of clay, that we might demonstrate the love of Christ and that people who do not know would come to know that love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation, let's all stand one last time as we sing hymn number 409. And we're going to sing all six verses.
congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, receive the benediction of your triune God. It is his blessing to you that he gives as we depart. From 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you.